last season, Nelsonville York finished with a record of 5-13, and, and they really wanted to bounce back from that. This year, they're already off to a much better start, starting off 2-0, and including a victory over their rival Athens, 57-42. to Up by one. Takes her steps, has the jump float serve. Sam Steele to McLean, to Archinska in transition. Beautifully done by the Bobcats. Seems like the Cats have continued their momentum ever since they've had that practice against Toledo the day before their Saturday game. The setters and hitters have been on the same page like they're in one mind. As Harchinska goes with the tip this time, Ball State puts it high up in the air. Walonsky gives Mitchum a chance. Mitchum with the roll shot. McLean to her line. Her line with the tip. And the middle blockers continue to keep it going. 2-1. Speaking of middle blockers, Kaitlin O'Farrell with the serve for the green and white. Walonsky goes to Mitchum. Mitchum this time gets a good run up, but Ohio's able to dig it. Now Margolis, McLean pushes it out to Harchinska. This will give Ball State an opportunity. Huber back sets it to Halverson. McLean diving attempt. Her line just free balls it over. So Ball State in transition. Plitt tries to get up above that one. Now Harchinska sends it right back with some power, some velocity, and it's a kill for the Cats. So Farrell continues her time at the service line. This time, Plitt's able to find her way over the plane of the net and picks up the kill. Cardinals with the response. And that brings back Haven Gates. Haven Gates, one of those back row players where if a ball is out of system, she is a setter and she's had some uh, setter experience. Blonsky pushes it outside to Reese, and Reese delivers the fastball right down line for the kill. Cardinals now at two straight. So Gates continues for the red and white, as that will be tied up close to the net, and her line still able to make the most out of it. So Ohio up four to three, and up two to one overall in terms of sets. Kaitowski with the serve. Belonsky to Plitt, and that's a beautiful hit right there into the attack line. And she is a talented hitter. Maggie Huber tried to go and pull a uh, Tria McLean there, trying to go up against the line, but does barely miss, maybe about a centimeter off, giving Ohio back the lead and the serve. It's Olivia Margolis. Get it to Gate. And there's a block from her line, being able to meet Gillen in the air and send it back to Gillen's right. Six to four. Bobcats trying to close out the Cardinals with this set. Gates with the pass, Walonsky back sets it to Mitchum, and Mitchum, her aim was not great there, trying to argue a touch was Coach Phillips, and Ohio maintains momentum up by three. As it looks like they will try to go for a sort of challenge here as Ball State, they have been pretty good at this so far today as they are 2-0 in terms of getting the challenges to be reversed towards them. And we'll see if it will be 3-0 after we get a replay here as the Bobcats doing what they can do to close it out. And we talked about O'Farrell. We talked about her line. And those two players still being able to continue adding to their great performances, whether that means picking up blocks or just picking up big plays. Yeah, both players have been contributing a ton for the Bobcats. You could say the claws are out for the Bobcats tonight. <laughs> they want that win. Uh, the Cardinals, they would respond to the Bobcats by saying that does not fly with us as the Cardinals are down by three as we'll check out the replay here. Being able to do anything for 80 days is quite a challenge, but to string together 80 days of catching 125 footballs is beyond commendable. With assistance from his father, Heath head coach Tim Ward, 
Eighth grader Joe Ward set a lofty goal for himself this summer. Words really can't describe uh, the feeling of pride that I have towards him. Uh, I mean, it, it literally started out uh, with actually a Bible verse uh, reading about how one man can take on a thousand and two men can put 10,000 to flight. And that's kind of where the idea came from is putting 10,000 footballs to flight. Although it was challenging, Joe internalized this quote and went to work making catch after catch all throughout the summer. Yeah, there was a lot of days that it was very hard to go out and do it. And I knew that I just had to put my mind and focus up that if I didn't do it today, then I was going to lose something that I've been doing for a while. As he went on, the Heath community started to get behind him more and more. And uh, we got our, uh, our pastor involved. We got the mayor involved. We got some police officers involved. Uh, past football players that have played for me in the past that played and graduated from high school before I went there. Um, it really kind of became a community event and, uh, and something that just is a memory that we'll have forever. It all culminated when Joe made his 10,000th catch. So once I like caught that final ball, it was like pretty cool that I did something for 80 days straight. Reporting for Gridiron Glory, I'm Cedric Granger. The Big Ten has been a thorn in the Ohio Bobcats side as of lately, losing games to Ohio State, Michigan State, of course, last year, and falling to Indiana um, the year before that as well. So a lot of tough losses. They've been close in games. The Michigan State game last year was definitely a very competitive match, and even though the score said 2-0, it was great defense by both sides, but nevertheless, the Bobcats will need to overcome the Big Ten. And one really great thing about field hockey relative to a lot of other sports along the NCAA landscape, bigger schools are not afraid to go on the road to play Mac schools or smaller schools. And it's more based off region, according to assistant coach Luis Abadi, where, hey, if a team is in your region, it makes sense to play them. Yeah, and then, uh, you know, speaking of that, next week, um, the Bobcats will host, uh, I believe, a week from today. Yeah, next Sunday, they'll host the Buckeyes here of Ohio State at, uh, at Pruitt Field. We'll have that call for you right here on Ohio Bobcat TV. But it'll be uh, another, you know, exciting matchup. And, of course, you know, anytime Ohio gets to play Ohio State in any sort of um, sport, it is always an interesting affair as, you know, there's always that, you know, slight rivalry, even though Ohio State is, of course, a much bigger program in most senses of the word. I remember when they, they came here for the softball game back in April, uh, you know, you, they packed out the softball o OSF over there. So, you know, it's always a good opportunity, like you said, to get those regional games in any Big Ten school, especially, you know, the schools like these, Michigan State, Ohio State, these big-time programs. It's, it's a great opportunity for exposure, and it's also just a good opportunity to be playing against some really, really solid teams, as I mentioned earlier, because Mac play is going to only get more difficult as we go into the business end of the season here. Yeah, it's definitely a great challenge for a lot of these Bobcat players as they're looking to try to get a little bit of an offensive presence, working near the attacking circle for the first time, but to no avail, free hit for Michigan State. Defense showcasing themselves to be pretty strong early on here for Michigan State. So they'll get the free hit where it's stolen by a nuke plan, and she'll try to work it up. There's Wesley Littlefield now with possession. Kind of retreats back, looking for her teammates. And Ohio being patient with eight minutes into the game. No score from Pruitt Field as the weather has become a little bit more crisp than usual. As Caitlin Whittle now with the ball. She has four goals on the season. And then the ball is taken away quickly by Michigan State going the other direction. Great play by Ellie Rutherford, the sophomore, who has four goals on the season. She tries to pass it up to her teammate, but puts a little bit too much on it. Rolls out the back. Three hit for Ohio. Yeah, looking for uh, Kim Smith, the freshman from the Netherlands up there who has come into the game as a substitute. And now the Bobcats substitute a couple of new players into the match. As Ohio, even though they don't have as many players as most teams around the NCAA, the 18 players, they can use that to at least leverage a couple of substitutions. However, one of their big problems in that Kent State match was that there were no not enough substitutions, and especially in the overtime match where it becomes uh, a six-on-six -six affair or seven-on-seven seven, but six-on-six six with field players, you could easily get outraced and have holes that usually wouldn't be there in the normal 11-on-11 11 11 format. 
and that's designed, of course, to make sure that a team can win the game in overtime. However, it's just not to Ohio's advantage this year with how many players they have, as now Michigan State works to the attacking circle, fighting in is Jarvie. Trying to box out, trying to look for room, and the ball is poked out. Dakotla now receives the ball on the far sideline, pokes it off of a defender from Michigan State. That's Boncheski who knocks it out. Ohio with the free hit, as no team has seemed to be in front thus far. It's been more in Ohio territory relatively, but overall it's been a stalemate. So that makes four strikeouts on the day for Cody Williams, and that'll bring on Caleb Johnson. Last time Johnson was up, he had a fly out to Clayton Hodges at center field. As Caleb Johnson is one of the newest members of the Licking County Settlers, and he was very impressive in his first start as a settler. It was against the Copyrights at the beginning of their series starting on July 11th. As we'll see a high fly ball out in the left field. It's a drive that goes down right before the wall as Bam Thomas, the left fielder, is going to have to make a throw out to second base, and there'll be a sliding double for the Licking County Settlers. Caleb Johnson absolutely harpooned that ball. It looked like it had a chance at one point to get out, but it did fall short and bounced into the wall. And Bam Thomas was able to pick it up off of the ricochet and keep it at a double. Caleb Johnson reaches second as that is the second double of the day. Funny enough, both doubles for the Licking County Settlers have come in two out situations. So Cody Williams will have his shot to close the door as Cody Williams is usually known for giving up a good amount of hits, but doesn't give up a lot of runs. He's the bend but don't break pitcher of this staff. That's a little bit of the first pitch up high for ball number one to Cade Nellis, who struck out swinging back in the second inning the last time he was up. Copper is up 2-0 to zero with one runner on and Caleb Johnson. Looking to end the top of the fourth inning here with a bang, as we'll see the 1-0 outside. So it's 2-0. As it is church day or church night here at Bob Wren Stadium. So got a lot of local churches that have been able to come here, show up, support the Southern Ohio Copper. As the 2-0 skips across the ground. It looks like Johnson's gonna try to take advantage of it. The throw to Mason Adoni is missed, and out into the outfield. Bam Thomas fields it. He's gonna throw it to home plate, and that throws off the mark, and that's a run for the Licking County Settlers. The errors come back to bite the Copperheads, and they pay the price as Caleb Johnson is able to get home off of the mistakes of the Copperheads. It's 2-1 to one here at Bob Wren Stadium. So those are the ones that just kind of shoot yourself in the foot as the 3-0 is outside. It's a four-pitch walk. Caden Ellis to first base here with two down in the inning. Copperheads just need one more out. But Caleb Johnson did make the Copperheads pay for their mistakes. So now batting for the Licking County Settlers. It's Logan White, the number seven batter on their order. He'll work with one runner on as the first pitch is up high for a ball. So Cade Nellis on first base off of the walk. That's walk number two of the day for Cody Williams. And it looks like Josh Steidel will have some advice. Josh Steidel, normally a catcher, but playing first base today for the Copperheads. So, of course, he'll have some really good advice for what's going on behind the dish. As the Copperheads mixed up the order a little bit today with Silva, a uh, catcher, Josh Steidel at first base. We'll see a nice little rotation there between Mitch Class, Bam Thomas, and Josh Deidel is the 1-0. It's too low, so it's 2-0 with two outs. Copperheads up 2-1 over the Licking County Settlers, looking to keep their lead. Settlers trying to take the lead for the first time today. The 2-0 to White. That time it's in the strike zone there. Is, it always feels great if you've thrown a couple of pitches off the mark just to get back and find that strike zone for the first time means a lot as now the count is two and one to Logan White who struck out swinging last time he was up. The two one high pop fly that's going to stay in the infield Maverick Stallings calls it makes the catch and the Copperheads retire the side the Copperheads give up one but do not yield the lead 
as the Coppers are up 2-1 to one going into the bottom of the fourth inning. You're listening to Southern Ohio Baseball on YouTube. <laughs> 